Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello everyone. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for sparing your time to listen to this webinar. Uh, the topic today is really interesting. How to get online students actively engaged, which I'm sure is a real issue for all instructors and teachers worldwide. Now, we are going to have the webinar today by our globally renowned speakers, Dr. Rebecca Brent and Professor Richard Felder. This webinar is organized by the University Technology Malaysia Faculty of Engineering, the Academy of Professors Malaysia, the Society of Engineering Education Malaysia, and of course, the main host is the Center for Engineering Education Malaysia. Now, the Center for Engineering Education Malaysia promotes scholarly practices in engineering education through research and supporting a community of practice in engineering education. That's the focus, but in general, we do pr promote STEM education and higher education. Nina, share screen. Nina, can you please share my slide? Nina? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen so that we can look at what is available. Okay, so actually, Dr. Rebecca Brandt and Professor Richard Fowler has been to Malaysia twice in 2005 and 2014. So they are not um, alien to Malaysia. They've been here and some of you most probably have met them. Now, they have been supporting us in the center and also the Society of Engineering Education Malaysia. The aim of the Society of Engineering Education Malaysia is aligned to the center. So we are working together closely with the center to promote high quality engineering education in the nation and in the region. So if you are teaching engineering students in Malaysia, join us and become a member of the society. Now, please don't forget to share like and subscribe the UTM CEE Facebook and YouTube channel because we have many more events coming up. Now, the next thing that I'm going to ask you is to participate in the webinar because we are going to have activities for you, the audience. Now, the first activity is this poll in Mentimeter. Can you please log on to www.menti.com and use this code. Insert the code 505895. Now, once you have entered Mentimeter, please answer this question. What concerns do instructors have about online classes? You can choose as many that you think is what instructors will be concerned about. So please put in your answer now. Okay, it's coming in.
great. 43, 46. Now, if you answer other, please explain what you mean by other in the chat area, either in YouTube or Facebook. Okay, so I think, well, it's still growing. <laughs> we'll wait a few more seconds, about 10 more seconds before we go on. Okay, we have reached more than 100. So we can see that it is still growing, but the choice for it's hard to figure out if students are learning and it's hard to get students engaged is growing very, very fast. It's, a, it's the top two. The next one, students feel isolated from instructors and classmates. Uh, the fourth one is students are often confused about what instructors want them to do. Okay, I have those concerns too. So it's really time for us to listen to Richard and Rebecca. So, well, our speakers today do not need much introductions. So I would like to welcome Rebecca and Richard to the stage. Well, we thank you so much. We have very fond memories of being in Malaysia and we're delighted to be with you now. And I wanna begin just by thanking everyone for putting their comments and filling out the poll. Uh, that, that really makes us feel that you are here, <laughs> which is very important. <laughs> it is so nice to have both of you here. I Thank wish you. we can have you physically, <laughs> but I think this is as good. <laughs> yes, well, I will join Rebecca in thanking everyone who made this possible and extending our greetings to all of our friends in Malaysia and those in India and in Korea and in the other places that you have checked in from. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be with you. So all of you who- So uh, we'll ask Nina first to share our screen our slides. So I'm looking forward to learning from you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whatever responses you checked in the poll about what concerns about online classes are, you were correct. All of the concerns listed there are very common. We have read a lot of literature and studies of online classes, and they include the concerns, and those were all there. We have the three that seem to come up most often in the literature we've looked at and in the people we've talked to, and we'll share those with you now. And before I go any farther, I'll tell you that we have a handout to accompany this uh, presentation, and it is online, and at the end of the presentation, the link to that handout will be shared with you. So all of the information that we'll be presenting to you now is in the handout, and there's additional information and a list of references. So you don't have to worry about taking a lot of notes. All of the information will be available to you at the end of the uh, presentation. So let's look at the three top concerns that we have found in our studies of the subject. Uh, probably the biggest one is just the difficulty of getting students actively engaged in an online environment. Many uh, 
instructors know that active engagement is a very important component of effective instruction. They've heard about active learning, they may have used active learning, they've led, read the literature, and they know that people learn by doing things and getting feedback on what they've done. They don't learn just by sitting and having somebody tell them what they're supposed to know. And so although they know active engagement is very important, they may be new to online teaching and they may re not really know how to get active engagement. And this is a major concern. The second concern has to do with the confusion that students may have about instructor expectations. They are just not sure, what does this instructor want me to do? In a typical face-to-face -face class, it's very easy for them to be unconfused. They can simply ask the instructor, what do you mean by that? Or they can talk to their classmates sitting next to them and come to an understanding about what is being required. But when the instructor is not there, they're just sitting alone in their room with their computer, it's not easy to get that information. And it leads to poor performance, especially if the instructor is calling for high level skills like creative and critical thinking. They don't even know what those things are. And then the third is the lack of connections between the students and their instructors in an online environment and between the students and their classmates. They are sitting alone at their desk with their computer. And this leads students in an online class to a sense of isolation, of just being alone out there with no real sources of support. And this leads to discouragement among many students. And there is a high rate of attrition, a high rate of dropping out of online classes because of those lack of connections. So in our time with you today, we're going to be stressing how to get students, online students, actively engaged. This topic would be interesting um, under uh, pre-COVID-19 <laughs> times, but with the pandemic, uh, many of you were in that position that many people in the United States were of suddenly having to move their classes online and not having enough time to really prepare and to, to do everything that's needed to make a class really work well. That's At this point, we're all being asked to think about what happens as we go forward. We need to be flexible. We need to be able to work in the face-to-face -face environment, but we also need to be able to to, to turn on a dime, as we'd say in the United States, to quickly uh, pivot to being able to work with students online. So that's what we're going to be about. We're not going to be about specific software, specific tools. Those vary wherever you are. We have different classroom management systems. We have different resources in different institutions and different tools that you can use. So what we're going to be focused on is how you really make those decisions about engagement based on what, what you plan to teach, what you want those students to learn. And then the specific tools, you can find a lot more information at your own institution um, when you pick out something that you want to use for a particular uh, use. At the bottom of this slide, you see some question marks, and that's just to remind you that at any time, you can feel free to enter questions in the chat box. There are many of you online, and so um, and there's probably no way we'll answer all the questions, but our uh, folks in the studio, Nina, will be helping us when it's time. We have a couple of times where we'll stop for questions and um, she'll help us to take some of those questions that you have and respond to them. We will also uh, happily give you contact information and share many, many of your questions will be answered in the handout as well, which has more information and you'll see that at the end. So why, Rich uh, shared with you a little bit about why get, we want to get students active. The first is the most important thing is just that if a st student is more connected, they're enthusiastic, they're motivated when they have things to do, when they're engaged with other students and with us. The second is that cognitive science tells us it works. Students learn by doing things, not just passively receiving information. And so in our classes, as much as possible, we want to be getting them active. 
The third thing to remember is that research tells us it works. There's been a huge body of research in both face-to-face -face classes and online classes showing that activity is the key to learning. And Rich is going to share um, the results of one big uh, study, and then we have more studies available to you if you want to um, find out more in the handout. So this research that I'll be telling you a little bit about is probably the most famous research study in the history of active learning. It is a meta-analysis conducted in 2014 by the National Academy of Science. They looked at over 100 different studies of the effectiveness of active learning. And the studies compared uh, learning outcomes in a traditionally taught class, taught by lecture, and a class taught using active learning. So on the left, you see a traditional class sitting and listening to a lecture. On the right, you see an active learning class. Students are clustered together in small groups working on something. The instructor is interacting with one of the groups. So the first result we'll share with you of the research is that in the traditionally taught class, the student's uh, average exam grade was a half a letter grade lower than in the actively taught class. So if in the traditionally taught class, the average grade on, an exa on examinations was 70, the average grade in the active learning taught class would have been 75. The study also compared the rate of failure of the course in the two environments, the traditional lecture-based class and the actively taught class. And the failure rate in the traditionally taught lecture-based class was one and a half times higher than the failure rate in the actively taught class. So if in the actively taught class, 20% of the students failed, in the traditionally taught class, 30% of the students would have failed. There were also other results that were presented in this study, but to put it all together, the study showed that active learning helped all of the students in the class. Um, and in particular, the students who were at risk, underrepresented minorities, other students who were considered more likely to fail, were helped even more than the, uh, the students who, did not who were not at risk. So it helped all students, but it helped the ones who were at greatest risk more. Now we're about to get into telling you some things you can do to get your students actively engaged, but we want to do another poll to find out how uh, familiar you are with active learning groups in face-to-face -face classes. Uh, so we'll ask you to go to menti.com if you have not already. The code is 505-895, and we'd like you to, um, to complete uh, the poll there asking how much have you used active learning groups in face-to-face -face classes? I think, um, let's see, Nina, I think you'll show the Menti poll at this point. Yeah. All right, great. We'll give folks a few more minutes. There's a tiny bit of delay. Um, so we'll give you just a moment or two to enter your responses. Hmm. It's exciting to see those polls changing. Great. So it looks like, and you can continue to put in your responses, it looks like that, that many of you have had at least some experience using active learning in those face-to-face -face environments. There are a few of you who are new, and um, we know that some may have only taught in more traditional ways, and some of you may just be new to teaching, and so you haven't had a chance to use active learning in any setting. So, um, good. All right. Great. So, thank you for completing the poll, and it's good to see what your colleagues uh, can, and what their level of experience is as well. Great. Nina, would you take us back to our slides? So we want to think about now, um, what do we mean by all of this active learning? For those of you who may not be as familiar, you might have heard that term active learning because that's the term that's out there the most. It's course-related activity 
anything but watching and listening to a lecture that engages all the students in a live class session. Well, that might be fine for synchronous classes happening where the students are all there at once, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in an asynchronous online class. And most of us are using tools, some tools that are asynchronous. And so we need a better definition. So we're using the term active student engagement, and it's just the same, except that it isn't limited to students all being there together at the same time. It's any way that they interact with course content, the instructor, us, or other students. So when we're thinking about face-to-face -face and synchronous on group, online group activities, we have a certain format or way to do it that works really well. And in your, um, on your screen, you'll see on the left a face-to-face -face group. And on the right, um, you'll see a, a, what is a Zoom group breakout room where four students are put together in a room and they can talk to each other. So that is a tool that many of our online resources have for us. So all the things that you're so familiar with doing in the face-to-face class, you can do using these breakout groups. There are other things you can do as well, but this, um, this will give you a basic idea. You have teams of two to four, and then sometimes you do these things individually. So in a few minutes, we may ask you to think about something yourself uh, to reflect on it. You With your students, you might ask a question and they jot down an answer. They do it individually. But in these breakout rooms or in teams in your class, teams of two to four. Choosing a recorder if needed, face-to-face, -face, they do that on a piece of paper. In a breakout room, maybe you have a Google Doc or Google Sheets or some other tool of that kind, which is a shared document where the recorder can log in and make notes in that document to record what the students are talking about in their group. Then you give them a few seconds to three minutes or so to do something. And we usually recommend that something should be challenging, should be um, something that's not just totally obvious. You want it to be worth the time, the conceptually difficult, maybe the hard parts of problem solving. That's what they should be spending their time working on in their in their team. You do have to be aware that when you put students in, say, a breakout room, there's a little everything takes a teeny bit longer because it just takes a while to get everybody in exactly the right spot. When you are ready for them after the three minutes has ended or the two minutes and you're ready to bring them back together, just like you bring back in a traditional class, get everybody's attention, it might look like what it does on the right where everybody's coming back. They aren't necessarily all looking at you, but they're at least back with you. And then you bring them together, call on it, some individuals or individual groups for responses and then make sure that correct answers are given, so the correct solution, so that students won't leave um, with wrong answers. Now, there's a, I want to emphasize a couple of points that Rebecca uh, just made. And before we do that, I wanted to remind you, as we go through this material, questions will probably arise in your minds about I don't understand why did you tell us to do this, or I don't know how you did this. Could you give an example? Anything of that sort, please enter it in the chat box, and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Now, the point I wanted to emphasize was focusing on the activities on the challenging parts. Those of you who have used active learning a lot, and there are a number of you there, according to the poll, will already know what I'm going to tell you, but for those who have not used it that much, somebody who's been watching what we've just been saying may get the idea that what we're telling you is stop lecturing. It's a terrible technique. You should never lecture again, and all of your classes from now on should be solid activity. No, that's not what we're telling you at all. You have to lecture or give materials in an asynchronous class a video of you lecturing or something for the students to read. Short. Short. <laughs> you know more than they do about what you're teaching, or at least I hope you do. And part of the time in the class has to be spent with you telling them what you know that you want them to know. 
the message that we're giving you is don't make lecturing the only thing you do. Some of the time, give the students something to do to help them practice what you've been teaching them, to test their knowledge of what you've been teaching them, and for them to find out there is something they don't understand, and now they're going to be more ready to hear it. What you should use the activities for are the hard parts of what you're teaching. If you're going through a problem, focus the hard parts on the activities. And then the easy parts, the parts that all of them will understand and know, go quickly through those so that you have time to spend the time on activities on the difficult parts. Now, if you're using active learning, there are three tips that we want to give you to help make the active learning, the activities successful. One we've already given you, make the activities challenging. If you give the students a trivial problem, they'll all know the answer immediately, and then you tell them to get into groups to come up with the answer, you're wasting their time, and they will know it, and they will not be happy about it. The second tip, which we've already given you again, is to keep the activities short. We've given you a rough, range of 10 seconds to three minutes. Why an upper limit of three minutes? Because if you give the students 15 minutes on an activity to solve a problem, let's say, some of them will get it in three minutes, and now they're wasting 12 valuable minutes of class time, if this is a synchronous class, and other students will not get it. They'll struggle for the full 15 minutes, which is like eternity, and they won't be able to get it. And that's intensely frustrating for them, and it's also a waste of time. Nothing much is happening by way of learning in after about three minutes. And that's the reason for putting an upper limit on the activity length. And then call on individuals first for responses when you bring the class back. Why do we suggest you do that? Because if, like most teachers, after you stop every activity, you just call for volunteers to report, several bad things happen. One, if you're teaching a class of 70 students, you're only going to be hearing from three or four of them, and the others will just sit there silently, not risking saying something uh, wrong. And then the other problem is if the students know that you're just going to call for volunteers, You've taken away any incentive they may have had to do what you asked them to do. They know they can just sit back, do nothing, and somebody else will provide the answer. But if they know you could call on them for the first or second response, they will make it their business to do what you ask them to do. Okay. We've been thinking a little bit about engagement using a um a group activity in breakout rooms, just like the face-to-face, -face. but we want to highlight just a couple of additional things that you can do uh, in this online environment. And right after that, we will be taking some questions after we get through this material. So uh, if you've got a burning question, be sure to write it into the chat. Another thing that you can do uh, in the online environment is polls, like we've been doing with multiple choice problems or questions, finding out students experience or asking a conceptual question. Many of our software tools like Zoom have yes and no uh, responses that the students can very easily do. You don't have to go uh, into any kind of fancy poll. And many of them have hand raising. Um, and so that yes or no and hand raising can also allow you to get a lot of involvement. Writing responses in chat or in the online document, a Google Doc like we talked about, is a great thing. The chat, if you have um, a smaller class, not a, not a gigantic one, you can respond to a lot of the things that um, they say in the chat and you can ask for their ideas. An online document allows you to harvest some of those responses and you can even um, use those to see and give maybe give them give some credit for um, students participating in that active way. Um, we're going to stop now and take some questions and I'm some. gonna I'm gonna stop sharing and um, and we'll take just a few moments to answer some questions. I think Rich has um, has one or two. I have several that uh, that you have submitted. 
one comment I wanted to share with you first. Uh, one of you, uh, after I made the point about the research showing the superiority of active learning to lecturing, one of them said, absolutely agree. I have tried traditional learning and active learning, and apparently active learning worked better for him or her, and he never turned back. I love to hear that. That was my experience too years ago. Um, and then I think Nina had a question. Okay. Nina, do you have one that you put up on the screen that we can address? Okay, when I do exercises and try to get students involved in calculating values, most remain silent. Even when I ask specific students by calling their names, they choose not to engage. Um, that can happen, but in my experience, um, and again, we are talking about cultural differences. Uh, we are dealing with American students, and you are dealing with Malaysian or Indian or Korean or whatever it may be students, and so students are different. What I've found is that even in my classes, some students just don't want to be called on, and they'll just say they don't know. And what I do at that point is, is nothing but casually move on. All right? I go to another student. Usually there are not that many of them who are refusing to say anything. And especially if I've told them I will be calling on individual students at the end of this exercise, most of them do what I've asked them to do so that they're ready. We're going to be um, thinking a little bit about that sort of student resistance uh, at the end of the, this presentation, thinking about ways that we can minimize that. But one of the things I would always think about is what is it I want students to be able to do and how does what I'm asking them to do in these groups map on to what I'm going to ask them to do in assignments that are graded and so and marked. So if students know that this these are the kind these are exactly the same kinds of problems that I'm going to ask you to work on in in an exam where examination. So you're going to need this material. I also strongly suggest that you think about especially the first activities you give Think about real world experiences. Think about things that are relevant to the student's experience, things in the, that are relevant to what's happening in the world, ways that you can connect to the kinds of jobs they see themselves doing someday. The more connections you can make like that, the more motivated they are going to be to respond to you. And sometimes they don't, which, which does happen. Great. Thanks for that question because it's a common one. This is another question. What would be the approach for active learning if students are not prepared for class? Uh, you could ask the same question about traditional lecture classes where they're face to face. That's always going to happen uh, with some students. But two things. One, I try not to be too concerned about it. If a student, if I ask a student to uh, report after an activity and the student wasn't prepared and the student just says, uh, well, I don't know. I don't make a big deal out of it. I just casually move on to another student. The only thing is, as I said before, if the students know this is going to be happening in class, that I could call on you randomly or any other student, most students don't want to be in a situation of having had an opportunity to prepare for something and be called on and have nothing to say and so after I've done a, these in a few classes, most of the students do what they need to do to be ready with an answer. And if once in a while I find one who hasn't prepared, I don't, uh, it doesn't bother me particularly, I just move on. One of you made the comment, we do contracting in the beginning of the session to prep everyone to contribute and to learn in a fun manner. If that works for you, that is great. Someone else said, uh, sometimes students are afraid of giving out the wrong answers. What I find is if I continue dropping hints on how to look at the problem, students seem to be less resistant in sharing those answers. I think those are excellent ideas. And one in particular, this notion of dropping hints, this idea of giving them a little bit of a clue about how you 
think. You are an expert in these things you're asking them to do. They're novices. So think about what can I say? What can I model for them? How I ask myself questions uh, about solving the problem or working through that material. And I think that yeah, you're right on track that all of those all of those things you know how to do in that face-to-face -face environment, it's the same thing in the online environment as well. There's another question there. Let's take one more perhaps mm -hmm. now and mm -hmm. then move on. Okay. Uh, this question is, what should be the effective number of students in a team? Um, my answer, and Rebecca may have a, a different one, I like two to four, anywhere from two students to four students. Obviously, if you have less than two, it's not a team. And what I find is that if I get more than four, usually somebody in the team is being left out or is leaving himself or herself out. Uh, and it's easy to hide in a team of four, harder in, uh, in a, time, a team of five, harder in a team of four. To me, three is the ideal team size, but not every class is divisible by three. And so I use two to four as a rule of thumb. And this holds true. Uh, later, we'll be talking a bit about ace, uh, purely asynchronous learning. And you may want to put students into teams to work together virtually, uh, where they connect via chat or they connect via video conference to work together. And just like in any sort of a session like that, the larger the group gets, the harder it is for students to communicate well and to work well together. So that generally is what four is a, the upper limit that we usually recommend. So we'll go back now um, to, um, to the slides and give you a little bit more information. Um, let's see, Nina, did I stop sharing? Yes, okay. <laughs> Sorry, just needed to be sure about what I was doing here. Uh, Okay, thanks for all of your really terrific comments. I uh, One of the last comments I read said that, yeah, someone had taught material and energy balances using Professor Felder's book and had uh, related things to cooking and gardening and all sorts of real world examples. We love to hear that. I certainly love to hear that. Now we'll be having some more questions at, a little bit later at the end. Um, so we'll go on and, and think a little bit about specifically what are some of the things we can ask students to do. Um, and I want to just share a few. Um, we can ask students to recall prior material, to summarize what did we do in class the last time, uh, just to kind of get them uh, going. They might answer or formulate a question, answer any of those normal questions you might ask the whole class. Instead of the whole class, ask them all to think about, jot down their response or talk to their teammates in that uh, virtual environment. You can also connect students. Students will have their phones out anyway, and they can text each other to compare notes on a question and then be ready to, to share that response in a chat box or, or in some other method. They can come up with questions they have as well. Brainstorming, critiquing, uh, lots and lots of possibilities. Um, yeah, the, uh, formulate a question is an interesting one. That's one of my favorite activities. A lot of teachers complain in traditional classes. I know a lot of my students are not understanding what I'm going over now, but they just sit there. I ask, do you have any questions? And none of them do very frequently, and that's very frustrating. Here is an activity to think about. You stop the lecture, and again, we're talking about a synchronous class now, but this can also be applied in an asynchronous environment. And you say, okay, I want everybody to, uh, if you're in a breakout room, I, wa uh, I want you to think of two good questions about what we've been talking about. If it's not a breakout room, I'm addressing each student individually sitting at their computer, I say, I'll give you. 30 seconds, think of two good questions about the material that I just covered in my presentation. And then I stop and I give them the 30 seconds or the 15 seconds or whatever I want to give them. And then I stop. 
And if we're doing this synchronously, they can do it in the chat window. And I get all the questions I want when I do that. And they're thinking about the material, formulating questions. It's a wonderful learning experience for them. Some of the other things they can do is respond to discussion boards, uh, threaded discussions. They can post their responses. They can do case studies. Uh, and that might take place on a discussion board with you giving prompts to get them to think about and write about uh, that material. So really, you're just trying to get them engaged with the content. They might watch a video. They might do a tutorial that you find that somebody has put together for the subject that you teach. They can still do team projects. So many of those things you would do in that face-to-face -face class, you can still do mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. online environment. And one of the, the internet is a wonderful resource for you. And many people have put interactive tutorials on every subject you can think of. And if I have a subject that I'm trying to uh, present some material on and I don't have a good tutorial at hand, uh, I will just say, uh, put in Google tutorial and then whatever the topic is that I'm interested in and up will pop many tutorials. I can just glance through them, find one that works for me and download it and use it in my class. And I think another thing that is a real advantage of this online environment is meeting different needs that students have. So you may have some students who are underprepared uh, and who need a little bit of, of help and screencasts or other kinds of tutorials that help pick up those gaps um, in the online environment, it becomes much easier to make that happen for individuals. Okay, what else can you ask students to do in these activities? And once again, everything we're saying now, or almost everything we're saying, applies to both synchronous and asynchronous online instruction. So let's suppose that you're teaching a course and you have a simulation, a computer simulation of a process or a procedure of some sort, or you're in a course that has laboratory instruction and you have a virtual lab. So you're simulating the laboratory and the students can run the experiments online and the uh, simulation in the lab will go through the experiment and produce the result. So what can you ask students to do if you have a situation like this? One thing you can do is if they're going to be running an experiment before they run it, you can say, predict the outcome. What do you think will happen when you run the experiment that has this description and they can enter their prediction. Then they can run the simulation or they can run the laboratory experiment and see what happens. And then they can explain the results. And particularly, if the result was different from what they predicted, they could be asked, well, you predicted that this would happen. And instead, this is what happened. Why? How can you explain the difference between your prediction and the actual outcome? And when you do that, you're getting to some high-level thinking required of the students. And if you're teaching a course that involves analytical problem solving, a and, course... And we know that many of you do. So many of you in, are in engineering or science or mathematics. Right. Or it, and it could be uh, economics or statistics or any other discipline that has uh, problem solving, analytical problem solving. You can present the students with a problem and ask them to classify it. If you've taught them that there are these problems that require this approach, those problems that require that approach, and so on, the first thing they can do with the problem you give them is put it in a category. Then, let's say it's a long problem, far longer than you can do in three minutes, or you can have them do in three minutes. You can say to them, all right, here's the problem, and go through the problem statement with them, and then say, in your groups, in your breakout rooms, or individually, get the problem solution started. See how, I'm gonna give you two minutes. See how far you can get in getting the problem solution started, go. And you turn them loose and see how they do. And then after you've given them the two minutes, you can bring the class back and call on some students to report on what they did, just as we outlined for you before. It may be a derivation of a formula. Okay, you have two minutes. Begin deriving this formula. 
Or you may have gotten up to a certain point in the problem or the derivation, and then you get to a difficult part. And then you say, okay, back to you now, in your groups or individually, if you're working individually, see how far you can go in taking the next step in this problem. Identify what it is and make as much progress as you can in one minute. And you let them go and you stop them and you call on people. And then instead of giving them a problem to solve, you can give them a worked out problem solution. And very often students looking at a problem solution will just nod their heads and think that they understand it. But instead of doing that, if they're working in a pair, say, somebody in one of your questions mentioned TAPS, thinking aloud pair problem solving, and whoever mentioned that, congratulations, that's a fantastic technique, right? But if they're working in a pair by distance, remotely, you can have one of the students explaining the first part of the solution to his or her partner. The partner asks questions if something isn't clear. They go back and forth like that, and then you stop them, and then they reverse roles, and the first, the second one explains it to the first one, and you can learn as much by doing that, explaining a worked out solution, as you can struggling with trying to solve the whole thing yourself from scratch. So I'm going to share uh, another idea. You might notice Rich looking down. He's going to check the uh, comments and see if there are uh, important questions or comments that you're making um, as you go. And if you scroll down, that will let you get to more. Um, okay, so some one other value in having students be engaged is formative feedback. So students get feedback from you that's not about their grade, but it just helps them to see how they're doing. And even more important, as I think, or as important, is you get information on how things are going for the students so that you can adjust uh, your instruction. When we have a class in front of us, we can see and look at them and see if they're getting confused or uh, it's a the problems are happening in the online environment, it's harder. One thing you can try is polling with conceptual questions, questions that have misconceptions embedded as some of the choices. So a common one you hear about is why is it um, warm in, in the summer and cool in the winter? How, how does that work? Why does that happen? And very often students have misconceptions about that. They think that the earth is closer to the sun in the summer. And so those kinds of misconceptions can be a part of the question and can help you to, to uh, see where students may be having trouble. You can have students submit a minute paper. Um, many of you may be familiar with that. You can do that in a face-to-face -face class. They may do that on a piece of paper. In a um, online class, they might do that on a Google form or in your classroom management system. There may be a place where you can have students give you feedback. They tell you what the main point of class was and what the muddy point or confusing point or the, the point that they were having trouble with and still didn't understand. You can then go back in and... Um, at the next class or send out a little video clip or send out an email that says, here's some problems. Let me help you to understand. I mean, let me clear up some of these problems. It's also really important to do a midterm course evaluation informally asking students what's working and what's not working for your learning in this environment. Many faculty here in the United States Part of the way into dealing with COVID-19 and having to teach online just went to their students and said, how are you doing uh, in this online environment? And really were able to see where students were having trouble. And so maybe they were having access trouble. Maybe they were stressed out. All those things can you can find out about and you can make um, changes in your course where they seem appropriate. 
So did you have one you wanted to say? Or? I, I've got a, uh, no, let's uh, keep going. Okay, I've got okay. some fantastic questions here, which uh, we'll get to in the question and answer Great. period. Great, yeah, we wanna kind of move quickly and get to that point so that we can answer more of those questions. So I wanna give you one just sort of conceptual overview of what we're doing, which is the forms that this online active student engagement takes and the benefits. The first is, taking any time students are interacting with content. And remember, it's not just listening to you lecture. It's anything they do that gets them working with the content, making sense out of it, making meaning, doing problems, watching video, doing tutorials, anything that they're doing that engages them with the content. It increases their performance and their self-confidence. But there are two other categories of things. They're interacting with you, uh, the student-teacher interaction, and student-student interaction. Student-teacher interaction, you'll see in the literature, it's called teacher presence or teaching presence. That means that the students see you as a person. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time on that on the next, uh, the last, I think that's the last slide that we'll, or, or the next to the last we'll be sharing with you. Then the student-student interactions are those um, when they're working together, and, and many times that's active engagement that we've been talking about, that creates a social presence. So when students are working online, they can sometimes feel like they're very much alone out there. And when they work with others, they begin to feel connected. Both of those things go into improving performance and into improving self-confidence because they're not by themselves. And I, I should add here that these uh, consequences that Rebecca is quoting, better performance, greater self-confidence coming out of these interactions, is not just speculation or a matter of opinion. All of these conclusions that we're giving you are based on solid research. So the other thing that these student-teacher and student-student interactions give us is students with greater motivation and a lesser sense of isolation. And those were some of those very opening concerns that you had. So it all comes back around uh, in a very in a very smooth way. Um, I promised you getting to establishing teaching presence and that sense of students personal connection to the teacher. We'd like you, um, if you have a, an idea, a way that you have found that works particularly well to help uh, connect with students in the online environment, especially the asynchronous environment where you hardly see them in real life. Uh, but if you've got some ways that you've found to connect, please do write them in chat. And Rich, if you'll uh, be watching, because we know there's a little bit of a delay, and interrupt me if there's some good ones that you want to share with the group. I'll give, um, I'll start to tell you a couple, but please feel free to put more uh, in the chat. Uh, one thing that works really well with asynchronous is to do a video introduction so that you tell students uh, something about yourself, maybe about what excites you about your field and this subject, why you're happy to be teaching there, and also maybe something personal so they can relate to you. It might be places you've traveled, if you like to travel, or your family or your pets, things that let them know that you feel comfortable sharing, that let them know you're a real person. Holding virtual office hours in a lot of different formats where they can text you or they can come to a chat room or a video conference with you. Different ways of connecting with them uh, so that different students' comfort level can be reached. Posting on the discussion boards, not overdoing it. You want it to be their discussion board, but intervening enough that they know you're reading some of it and you're commenting. And then think about posting or doing video feedback to individuals or the whole class if something's confusing or they have difficulty on an assignment or with the minute paper or the midterm evaluation. All of those things help to create presence. Did you have any ideas you wanted to share, Rich? Um, From the, this group? Do um, they, no, they not, have any yet? <laughs> not, not, not yet in response okay. to that one. Uh, yeah, they... Uh, asynchronous communication tools. Uh, establishing presence means that you have to be uh, establishing yourself. And some of the tools are, uh, are fairly primitive. 
email is one of them. Students, uh, when I teach online asynchronously, uh, my students always have ways of uh, contacting me. Right? They have my email address. I, I've, I've debated about whether to put my phone number so they can send me text messages. And I generally no, don't do that. And I, <laughs> they're told, uh, if you send me a text uh, before 8 o'clock in the morning or after 10 o'clock at night, you fail this course. <laughs> He's immediately. just kidding. He's just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's ever done it, so they <laughs> couldn't test me on it. Uh, but email, um, video uh, posts online. If you have a course website, then you can post messages to the entire class. And that's a really good thing to do. That's the bottom suggestion on the, on the left there. If I've identified that my students are having trouble with something, a lot of trouble. They had trouble on a la on an exam, or uh, they contacted me in virtual office hours, and several of them have said, uh, "I don't understand the the concept of enthalpy or, or whatever it may be." Rather than individually sending responses to individual students, if I see it's a common problem, I'll post the message and even e either email it to everyone in the class or put it up on the course website and they can all access it. All right, we've got one more topic that we really want to hit and that is student resistance to active learning. And Rich, I think I'll do this so that you can check these. Uh, okay. Um, so the first thing is that we, we all know that that was the first question we saw, one of the first questions we saw when you began to post them. What do I do about students who don't want to respond or don't want to do the activity or don't seem to be engaged? So there is some student resistance to active engagement. That's not necessarily what they're used to. And there's a little bit of pushback. And so the first thing to note is it's completely normal for them to do that. And it, and there's been some recent research showing that it's really less resistance than you may be afraid of. Some of us are fearful that everybody is going to be resistant, but it's, it's less than you think. Many students are very open to active engagement, but um, it tends to happen early in the semester and then to trail off pretty quickly. So remember that. Explain why you're using active engagement. So early on in the class, to explain in writing or in a video or, or in a synchronous class that you've got research that shows that students are going to have better grades and fewer, fewer of them will fail if you use active engagement. And so that's why you're going to do it. So that helps them to understand uh, if, even if they are a little resistant. Do a midterm evaluation. Ask them how things are going. And most of the time by midterm, they will be settling down. And if there's still students who are a little resistant, uh, it's just usually a very small number at that point. Uh, so the final suggestion is don't worry. <laughs> there are always some students, things happen in their lives. They may not be in the right place. There's all kinds of reasons there's resistance. And I try very hard not to take that personally and to realize that it's okay if you try to make the best environment you possibly can. And some students just may not take advantage, but you do the best you can. Um, so when we want to make one final point before we take more, um, more of your questions, and that is, um, as we're trying to transition into online education, don't try to do everything at once. Just select a couple of tools, a couple of ideas for your next online course, which you can tweak and use in different ways and see if they work. And if they work, keep them. And keep looking around and listening to your colleagues and reading things. And you'll find another idea. Maybe the next semester, you add a couple of additional ideas and you continue uh, to improve what you're doing. And just give those ideas a fair try. Don't try them just once. Um, and just an additional note about this piece of advice. If you uh, listen to what we've been saying in this session, and if you read the handout afterwards, which has a lot more ideas, uh, there may be 50 or 60 things that we've suggested that you do in online learning. 
And if we've made a good impression on you, you may decide, oh, those all sound like great ideas. I'm going to implement every one of them starting next Monday. Don't. That's a terrible idea. If you try to do too much new too soon, you're going to be blown away by the difficulty of managing all of those things that are unfamiliar to you. Uh, the students will probably be fairly unhappy because you'll be throwing too many new things at them before you're really used to them, and it probably won't end well. And that's why we're giving you this advice. Just pick a couple of those ideas that seem reasonable to you in your next online course and try them. And if they work after you've given them, tried them a few times, then keep doing them. If they don't work, then stop doing them. Next time you teach an online course, try another one or two ideas. And if you take this gradual approach over a period of time, you will get to where you want to go. And it works the same way as in traditional teaching. And finally, our last message is you can do this. You can do this. Uh, it, it's challenging at first, but we know that you can. Now, I'm going to show one last slide. And I think um, that I, how you access the handout is there. But I believe Nina is going to show that on a uh, screen on the bottom of the page so that we can now stop sharing and we can take um, questions that you may have. Um, I, have yes. I, I have the questions here. So I, I think, uh, Nina, I will uh, read the questions and comments, and then Rebecca and I can go directly to them. So you don't need to do that. But um, save the one you put up just now, and we will take that one. <laughs> Hold on to that one. Yes. Um, all right. So there are several comments and several questions. Uh, one of the participants said, we do contracting at the beginning of the session to prepare everyone to contribute and learn in a fun manner. And that sounds like a beautiful approach. What you don't want to do is surprise the students with active engagement. But if you let them know ahead of time, here's how this class is going to work. Here's why I'm doing this. Here's why it's in your best interests, among other reasons, because I have a lot of research that says you're going to learn more and get higher marks if I teach this way. That preparation can greatly increase the response that you find yourself getting from your students. Uh, Nina, put up the question you had, because I think it was important, it was about connectivity. Um, I think, um, I, if I remember correctly, yeah, we we're talking about how some students in your con your countries may have difficulty con connecting, um, and so the synchronous, especially the synchronous uh, environment, may be really challenging for students. You may not have heard about this from where you are, but this exact same problem is is the case here in the United States. And even if people have good internet access into their home, but everybody's at home working and everybody's trying to connect and use zoom and do the the broad the the width, bandwidth is not there and so that's a good reason for moving some things uh having some choices for students that are asynchronous where um, there are pieces of the course that can be done without having to be at a certain place at a certain time with your connection. Um, and that can really, um, really help students. And you can drop down a little bit um, in, in that expectation. Uh, one thing you can do is the discussion board type of engagement is a really valuable tool for getting students who maybe are able to do synchronous things, but it's another way for students to interact with the content. So thinking about um, having students even look at problem solving on a discussion board, giving them ideas about giving hints to each other or recommendations about how to approach a problem that may be on a problem set. Um, that can be really valuable for students in the more technical disciplines uh, in engineering. Um, other kinds of things like case studies where students can dig in. They can do a lot more than we think they can sometimes. Good. Um, this is a question. Could it be that it was the additional time students have to spend on the subject in active learning that resulted in the better grades? 
time outside lecture hours. It's not at all clear to me that they have more time outside of lecture hours when you use active learning. Uh, generally speaking, it's the same amount of time outside. But what I have learned from reading the brain research and reading the empirical studies is that it's the practice that students get in active learning and it's the guided practice they get in active learning that's responsible for most of the benefits you see. The contrast between, say, I'm teaching a difficult problem solving step in my engineering course and I can lecture all day on it in class and I can demonstrate it. The students can see me doing it. And when they see me doing it, if I'm a reasonably clear teacher, they're nodding their heads. They're saying, oh yes, oh, that's clear. I understand that. And they leave the class very enthusiastic. And then they go home to do the homework and they struggle for three and a half hours on the same kind of problem that I showed them how to do in class. Because when they were nodding their heads and saying, oh, that's clear, they didn't understand it at all. There may have been a couple of little things I did that were subtle, that looked straightforward when they saw me do it on the board or on the document camera, but they didn't get it and then they can't do it when they go home. But if when I get to that same point in the, in the difficult problem and instead of just doing it, I tell the students, get a partner, and this is in my face-to-face -face class, but I can do the same thing in a breakout room. I say, get a partner, take two minutes, see if you can figure out how to, what to do next in this problem. And they do, and I give them the two minutes, and then I stop them. And then I start calling on people to tell me what they did. Two things happen when I do this. Some of the groups get it. They figure out how to do it in their two minutes. If they did that, they understand it, and they can do it because they did it. On the other hand, other groups will struggle for the two minutes and be unsuccessful. They couldn't figure it out. But now when the answer is going up in the class, I'm getting it from the students and I'm repeating it so they all see what it is. Those students who tried themselves and failed are on notice. This is something I need to know how to do and I don't know how to do it because I, we tried and we failed in class. So now when the answer is coming out, they're paying attention. Their ears are pointing straight up. And if something happens on the, out there that they don't understand, they'll say, wait a minute, I don't understand that. Explain it again. When those students leave that class, that class session, they understand it. And now when they go home, they only struggled for two minutes here but that saves them struggling for three and a half hours out there. I think also what part of what Rich is talking about is this idea of desirable difficulty, not that we throw them out in, in homework to struggle for hours and hours, but that we give them a little bit of struggle. And um, I see someone recommended How Learning Works, the, the book, How Learning Works, Seven Research-Based Principles for Smart Teaching. Uh, that's one of the places, that's an excellent one. And that's one of the places that I learned about this, that you really, um, you know, you want students to have a their needs to be a need to know <laughs> and when they struggle with something and have trouble with it can't quite get it then they're much more receptive to us coming in and and feel, helping to fill in those gaps um, I would say one other thing about using these new tools and online instruction where that may not have been something that you did before I think students are also kind of overwhelmed and there's a lot new and it's an environment they didn't necessarily ask for. And so I think it's really important to have compassion about that and to have humility and to, and sometimes you may try something that doesn't work so well, or they don't have the capability, the connectivity to do it. Uh, so I think, you know, that's, um, when that happens, to have some compassion about it and to be willing to change if you need to or adjust uh, if you need to. Here's another question. Um, how is group work effective when it's done online? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, it's as effective online as it is in face-to-face. -face. And if you think about it, group work, group project work, group assignment work, 
is pretty much the same online and offline and face-to-face -face because in, even in a face-to-face -face class, most of the group work on projects and assignments is done offline. It's not during a class session. The only difference is how the groups communicate. And so in a face-to-face -face environment, they can all meet if they're all going to the same school, which they usually are. They can arrange to meet in the evening, during the day, in the library, in a conference room, and talk that way. If they have internet connection, the tools that we're using now enable us to get uh, together in groups. If you're using software that allows for breakout rooms, um, then you can take your whole class and you can assign them in groups of three or four to separate breakout rooms and they can meet in those rooms. And it doesn't have to be during an, uh, a synchronous class. They have access to the software. They agree. They could be on different continents and they can agree. We're going to have a FaceTime meeting. We're going to have a Zoom meeting. We're going to have a WebEx meeting or whatever it is get together, work on our project, work on our assignment. And the research that I've read says that uh, they're a little more clumsy. It's not as convenient as sitting next to each other, but it has the same positive effects on uh, performance, on learning teamwork skills and all of that. And I think it also reduces the student isolation. Uh, project work or a teamwork around uh, assignments or just for mutual support where they have an assigned team that reduces that isolation because students have complained that I can't, when I'm in class, come into class early, I can ask my friend about something that I missed the class before. I can, if I didn't hear the teacher, I can, you know, ask or um, just get little informal help and see how other people are doing. And when they're, in the online environment, it's not as easy. So they're more receptive in many cases to doing this kind of group work. You can also do some really nice things about sharing what they're doing, where they put together a slide or they put together something uh, online that allows their friends to see what they're doing. And that makes a, almost an easier way of sharing the group projects and group presentations. They can be short videos. You can challenge them to be creative in how they put it together. And the students always surprise us with their, with their creativity. And, and another question is that uh, in online instruction, there are delays in responses. Communication is not as easy and and as synchronous, even in a synchronous course sometimes, as it is in face-to-face. -face. You've seen that here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, it, that's a fact of life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true. And we are not about to tell you that, well, online instruction is just as good in every way as face-to-face -face instruction. It isn't. And if you give me a choice, would I rather teach face-to-face -face or online, I will tell you face-to-face -face every time. But sometimes we don't have a choice, like now, when all of a sudden practically every teacher in the world has been put in a position of having to teach online whether they want to or not. So we have to deal with the situation. What may happen because of the slowness of online instruction is you may simply not be able to cover as much material in your class as you're used to covering. The fact of the matter is, though, that uh, even in our face-to-face -face classes, we never get through all of the material that we wanted to cover. There's always that little bit that's left at the end that we want to cover, but we can never make it. And so we may have to do a little bit more compromising. Uh, Rebecca and I have written some material on coverage of uh, syllabus coverage, and we talked about strategies for making sure you get through the most important material. And we can share that. We're not here to sell our book, but we have a book called Teaching and Learning STEM, A Practical Guide, where we go into issues like that. And we also have a blog, which we'll put a link to in the handout for this webinar, that uh, some of that material, like that on civil syllabus coverage, is referenced, and it'll, it'll send you to that. 
Okay, I think we're probably coming close to the end of our uh, time. And uh, I think there's Kyria. Uh, one thing we wanna say is just how much we uh, appreciate all the engagement, the wonderful comments, uh, your willingness to jump in and do the polls and to connect with us. Uh, I, I only wish I could see your faces, but, but we thank you for your engagement. We really appreciate that very much. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca and Richard. It's so great to hear from you again. So, you know, it's not, you're like a star here. <laughs> you're the star of active learning. <laughs> and a aging stars. <laughs> well, it's legendary. <laughs> so we have got people from all over the world to tuning in. There was even so somebody from Malawi. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank, uh, thank you to all the audience for joining in. I'm sure all of us have learned a lot and it's really nice to hear the encouragement from you. I think this is the, what we need at this moment to go on and not stop trying. Very good, thank you. Okay, so everybody uh, in the audience, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel. We will have more um, coming up later on June 25th, we have another webinar. Uh, it will be given by Professor John Mitchell from University College London on the Integrated Engineering Program. So thank you, Rebecca and Richard, again. Please, you know, join us again sometime in the near future. We hope to also learn from you again. With pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure.